Well, hello, everyone. I'm James Dobson, and you're listening to Family Talk, a listener-supported ministry. In fact, thank you so much for being part of that support for James Dobson Family Institute. There are few tragedies in life that compare to the emotional pain that accompanies infertility. Recent medical research has shown that there's a frightening trend in both of these areas. Experts say that nearly 15% of all pregnancies tragically end in miscarriage. And the Center for Disease Control says over 6 million women suffer with infertility every year. Chances are you have a friend or family member who has experienced this kind of heartache. Or maybe you and your spouse are struggling through this difficult journey right now. Well, we pray that this broadcast will be an encouragement to those who are hurting. Today, you're going to hear from three women who have suffered a miscarriage or have battled infertility. Their names are Lynn Binky, Leslie Snodgrass, and Janet Malcolm. They started an organization called Stepping Stones, which directly ministers to these hurting mothers and their families. Now, since the original recording, these three ladies have retired, but Bethany Christian Services is continuing their mission. This is a highly emotional and honest discussion that will certainly touch your heart. Here now is Dr. James Dobson to tell you more about today's guests. We have three women here who have experienced infertility. Janet Malcolm, Lynn Binky, and Leslie Snodgrass. It's a delight to have you all with us today. Uh, in fact, why don't you start by telling us how you came to be here? I think that's kind of an exciting story. We had contacted you, Lynn, because of your work with the Stepping Stones organization. But how did that result in the three of you being here? We were so excited. As soon as Diana called me, I called Janet to make sure we had enough money in the account to come out here. And by the time I called Leslie, I had Janet on call waiting, saying, my husband says, if you have an opportunity to see Dr. Dobson, this is too important, even if I have to pay for the whole trip myself, you're going. And so Janet called and said, see if Leslie can go, too. There's a general consensus. <laughs> was your husband that <laughs> generous? Oh, yeah. <laughs> he was thrilled. And then your church also came through and, and helped uh, support your trip. Is that right? Our World Outreach Committee. Well, well you so, know, in a, in a small ministry like this, there's not a lot that the church as a mm-hmm. corporate body can do, and they were excited. just excited, excited to be able to help. help. I'm delighted to have you here. I want to hear your stories individually, how you came to this moment. You know, I, I'd like to, to have just a little bit of the details, and then we'll take it from there. Janet, we're going to start with you. I was diagnosed with endometriosis in 1979. We'd been trying for almost a year. It's kind of funny because my husband and I had decided we'd been married five years and we were deciding we needed a change in our lives and that we either needed to move to the mountains or we needed to have a baby. (laughs) Believe me, we should have moved to the mountains because (laughs) if we'd known what we were headed for, we probably would have gone there. But that was uh, a tough year, wasn't it? It was. It was. I had surgery in 1979, had one ovary removed and a wedge taken out of the other one. And we just expected the best. And uh, about another year passed, and nothing had happened. And they figured that the endometriosis had come back again, sent me to an infertility specialist. We went through the laparoscope again to see what was wrong, and there was scar tissue from the previous surgery that was causing trouble. So he did a, let's see, this would be a fourth surgery by this time, and removed the endometriosis that had reoccurred and the scar tissue. And we waited again. And it Hmm. just didn't work. Were you during that year saying, dear God, why can't we have a baby? That's probably the least of what I was saying. The Lord was so patient with me. I I was really angry and bitter. and, And I prayed that the Lord would send someone to my door to ring my doorbell that I could open up and they'd say, can I help you with a problem? You know, I was so desperately wanting someone to talk to about this because I was not dealing well with it. I was angry and I couldn't understand. I felt like it was my right as a woman. Mm-hmm. I was created a woman. I had the right to be a mother. I'd always wanted to be a mother. When you were a little girl, did yes, you look I forward to Yes, I always. That? I babied my little brother and finally my mother gave me a little sister when I was 10 and I babied her. And I, I just always had a motherly mm-hmm. instinct to... My husband didn't like being babied. So, <laughs> so it was time to do something different. Either that or move to the that's mountains. That's right, right. That's right. So, but it was um, it was an answer to prayer to find Lynn and Leslie, 
And once we started working with Stepping Stones, I was able to get my mind off of my problems and reach out to other people and just to be able to say, hey, I know how you feel. I feel the same way. Huh. And once I got into the Word and um, the Lord brought many special miracles into our lives and worked it all out. Hindsight's always twenty twenty, so, uh, but all things were working for good. <laughs> Lynn, have you come a similar pathway? No, not really. Um, my husband's father died when he was real young, and he wasn't sure he ever could be a good father because he hadn't had a model. Hmm. So we were married several years before he decided, today, mm-hmm. <laughs> now, now we're going to have a baby, and just like everybody else, we assumed that we were going to start today and that nine months later we'll have a baby. I took a job expecting to work there for six months and then stopped to prepare a nursery at home, and I was there for six years. I've always um, been fairly content because I never let myself want anything that I couldn't have. So I handled not being able to get pregnant pretty well until I finally did get pregnant and then lost the baby. Hmm. Did you tell everybody at work you were leaving? Oh, yes, yes. And I was so looking forward to being at home. and, And I'd really kind of waited those six years for a baby to make the decision in my life, to change my life instead of taking control of my own life, which I think is a mistake that a lot of infertile women make. But then losing the baby was hard because I'd finally allowed myself really to want want a baby. Did you as a little girl look forward to motherhood, uh, you know, as Janet did, were you? No. No, I was into books and science and all kinds of other things. I wasn't ever domestic. But my husband and I had both been teachers, and nurturing children was something that Uh uh, the desire to do had grown in us together. And I knew he would be a good father, and that was something that we just looked forward to doing together. When did the realization sink in on you that you weren't going to be able to have children, or did you ever give up? I don't think that I gave up. I trusted God. I'd been through a broken engagement before I was married. I learned then that if this wasn't what God had in store for me, and I thought it was so good, that he must have something even better. And I found that was true when I met my husband. So I believed that if God wasn't going to give me a baby, that he must have something better in store for me. And I trusted him that that he would give me the desire for whatever it was that he had for me. So I didn't give up. But, but losing the baby when I finally was going to have what we had decided that we wanted was huh. difficult. You sound like you didn't go through quite the struggle that Janet did. Is that right? I think that's right. Yeah. I uh, approached it so, more. So women deal with this individually. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's more like Peter. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, Leslie, let's, let's hear your story. Well, I'm kind of between the two of Janet and Lynn, it's really neat the way God has put us together because we each come at it from a different angle and each of us come at it differently emotionally. Uh, David and I had been married a year and we didn't want to wait a long time to have children because we had married late. And so we started almost immediately. And I can remember it being a real surprise to me that something I had taken for granted all my life that... I would have a child was not within my control, that something that essential to my body and my person, my femininity, was out of my hands. All three of you have made reference to that, that it came as a shock to you. Mm-hmm. It was a surprise. Well, I it think was an we assumption. we just take it for granted, yeah. you know, we, that we when the time comes. We set a goal and go after it. Uh-huh. Any woman and, can have a baby. You yeah. know, you oh. always hear that. Uh-huh. Well, and as a Christian woman, that's essential. You know, you yeah. just that's something you feel like God wants you to do to grow and nurture his family and bring them up in the Lord. And I went through all the infertility workup, not all of them, but most of the major ones I think um, an infertility specialist would recommend. And we never did find a problem in four years. After two years um, of going for Clomid and and monthly checkups, Mm. um, I did conceive and I lost the baby. And like Lynn, that was a real shock again that once you achieved a pregnancy that did not automatically mean a live birth and that to me was probably my hardest struggle with infertility because it raised all the the spiritual questions that hadn't really quite sunk in why god why god why would this be created to be taken Mm -hmm. and we don't have all the answers but we know he is 
all-powerful and has his reasons. Now, the women that I've talked to who are having this problem, and certainly those that write us, uh, speak of an outrage, of an incredible frustration and an anger, an anger at God, an anger at their friends, an anger at people within the family mm -hmm. that are able to produce children, mm -hmm. and some of them more than they want. Mm -hmm. uh, did you all uh, well, It's experience? hard to yes. come from a fertile family. You know, every time I turned around, either my sister and my sister-in-law was expecting a baby again and you know after going through surgery you know and surgery and surgery and month after month after month just waiting and you just scream out and really it's not that you're not happy for them it's just that won't it ever be my turn you yeah. know will I never be able to announce that we're going to have a baby Janet can you remember an afternoon perhaps or a, a family occasion when one of those pregnancies was announced and what you uh -huh. felt and what you thought when you went home. Can you really? <laughs> oh, my family won't listen to this. <laughs> yes, I can remember a time when um, we had lost a baby we thought we were going to get through adoption. And it was a little boy, and we had gone out and bought all the cute little boy things. And not too much after that, I found out that my sister-in-law was expecting again. And I knew in my heart it was going to be a boy, and the Lord was going to ask me to give my clothes to her. I just knew it was going to happen. She had a boy. And the first time she brought him home, I had to force myself to go and try to act happy, try to act excited for her. And in the midst of that, we were having dinner. And I'm, I'm from a very large family, and we were all eating. And all of a sudden, my... One of my other sisters said, oh, by the way, Janet, did you know I'm pregnant again? This was her third. And when I looked up, the whole family had their faces down in their food. Uh -huh. And it was like, what is she going to do? Is she going to cry? You know, it was just dead silent. Oh, it was just the worst. Did they know what you were going oh, through? Oh, sure. Uh -huh. Did your sister-in-law th know? Yes, yes. And, yeah. you know, I looking back... They're in an awfully hard yes. place, too, because they how do you tell them? How yeah. do you tell someone that you're expecting? And I'm sure that she felt like that was the best way and the best time that she could do it. Yeah. And it was devastating. One of the purposes for this broadcast is to help uh, women who are going through what you're talking about to know that they're not alone. And so before we get into some suggestions and some solutions, uh, I'd really like to make sure we have described the circumstances. Uh, what is it like being infertile and wanting a baby like you all were talking about and going through Christmas? We kind of, I think we've written several articles about that because that's a time that people are really low because all the commercials are about all the children under the tree and Santa Claus and the stockings and family and, traditions. And when you get too old to have somebody hanging stockings for you, you make up for it by hanging the stockings for your children. And when there isn't anybody there to do that, the yeah. whole part of your life is just gone. That's still a tender spot for you, isn't it? It is. It never really, you don't it ever forget end. it. You know, you just, uh, I don't know if maybe the Lord has just maintained that sensitivity within us because he has work for us to do in this area, but it's still, every time I still think of sitting in the doctor's office with all these pregnant women around me discussing their Lamaze classes, when I'm just there to see if I can continue to take Clomid, it still hurts and it can still bring tears. Or Mother's Day. Or Mother's Day. Day. Last year, I had to stay home from church on Mother's Day just because I had special friends in the congregation. I knew it was tearing them up, and I just couldn't handle that. It sounds crazy, but that's... In fact, it does sound crazy to people who haven't been there, and mm -hmm. that's part of the problem, mm -hmm. is it? But it's it's hard hard isn't it? Because the, the rest of the world doesn't understand. Right. So many of our mothers had more children than they wanted. It's really hard. There wasn't birth control then. So it's real difficult for them to identify with getting to the point of desperately wanting a baby. For so many of them, it just came so naturally. And so many of them are being aborted today, too. Mm. That's, That's a, a whole real big thing. thing with readers. You know, why would God allow all these millions and millions of babies to be aborted when I just want one? It's a hard question to deal with. Going back to that, um, 
Janet's sister announcing at the table and all the family waiting to see how she was going to react to it, we found that it's because infertility has a lot to do with how we see ourselves as women. If they don't tell us like we're normal women and include us in the announcement with everybody else, it's just one more area in which we feel excluded. We feel outside the realm of womanhood. Isolated. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it was this obvious. Is, it really a, it was a, obvious an assault that, on the right. self-esteem, isn't it? It's, it was obvious. It's, Everyone else knew uh-huh. that she Janet was expecting, was but out. I was singled out and just <laughs> watched to see how she was I going to react to it. I think it's almost easier, as far as they see it, to tell them in a crowd because Janet probably won't burst into tears and run screaming from yeah. the room in front of her entire mm-hmm. family. And... There isn't any easy way for mm-hmm. it. Wouldn't it's I, difficult. You know, looking back, it would have been hard no matter what way they told me. Mm-hmm. I, I would have taken it. Mm-hmm. So they're in hard. a tough spot too. They yeah. are. Well, this is certainly a sensitive subject and a tender one at that. And these are some brave women who have openly shared their hearts today here on Family Talk. I'm Roger Marsh, and if these stories describe your life's journey right now, please know we are here for you. You can call us at 877-732-6825, and a member of our staff will be happy to talk with you and to pray with you. Again, that number is 877-732-6825. Now, as we rejoin this conversation, uh, the women in our panel are going to be describing their husbands' responses to this heartache. They'll also share the collective love and support that they have developed for one another during this difficult season. Here now is the remainder of their meaningful conversation with Dr. James Dobson on this special edition of Family Talk. Well, I think I was especially blessed in that he didn't do anything that was wrong except complain about getting a sperm test. And my immediate argument was, with what I have been through, I don't want to hear anything about you getting a sperm test. But I think that there are some men that just withdraw within themselves and... Um, because of not either knowing how or quite what to say, don't say anything to their wife as, as encouragement. My husband had sent me some flowers once, and I, I have kept the card. It was years ago. And he just said, I don't understand why you're having to go through this. I had just found out that I was going to have to have another surgery, and I was just so low. And he said, I don't understand why you're having to go through this, but I just want you to know that I love you. I'll keep that forever. Yeah, it course. it will last me for years. I think that was the last time I got flowers, but <laughs> <laughs> it'll last me for years. He I, doesn't have to come up with answers. That's right. All he right. has to has to do is just hu- understand. You know, there. Just a hug. Yeah. If they would just come up and just hold me. I asked this of the four of you. Uh, isn't it common also for people to begin to make snide comments about their sex Such life? Oh. Well, people it's, offered to demonstrate for mm-hmm. us. Yes. Mm-hmm. You're kidding. Because Aww. we must not keep doing it right. Mm-hmm. Yes. Most of the time, people mean well, and the, the suggestions and the comments are well-intentioned. But like Lynn's comment, that that has happened. And the, some of the letters we've received have just been really kind of tragic. But you have no intimate life anymore. The yeah. doctor knows yeah. everything. Yeah. That is, <laughs> no, and, and it's no more lovemaking on for love making it's yeah what, on schedule what you know i can remember it? when my husband <laughs> was in oklahoma and he called and i said you have to be home tonight it's mm. got to be tonight and he drove all the way home and it was two o'clock and he was too dark <laughs> worn out <laughs> <laughs> we missed it and but that's how it becomes and it's, then to go through that and lay your life out and wow. have nothing happen it's, also uh, i think we ought to talk a little bit about miscarriage because uh, I'm, I'm really you know, getting some incredible letters on that subject. Lynn, you went through that. Yes, and that was, that was the low point in my infertility. And I approached these things philosophically. intellectually, philosophically, yes. And the questions that I had that nobody could answer, like, now, if we hear all this about aborted babies and how since they really are babies, they should be buried. You know, I mean, they're, they're real babies, okay? When I had a miscarriage, they said, we'd like to take this to the lab. And so I was thinking in terms of an autopsy to find out what was wrong. They never brought it back. And it didn't occur to me until later 
That was my baby. I don't know what I would have done with that little tiny body, but it just seems wrong to have discarded it somehow. But all these people who know that these aborted babies are babies do not recognize the miscarriage. Janet was talking to somebody who said, do you mean they had a miscarriage or they lost a baby? Like it was a whole different thing. And people couldn't tell me, theologians couldn't tell me if I now have a baby in heaven. They couldn't tell me what was the appropriate way uh, to dispose of that baby's body. There is no legitimized way to grieve over a miscarriage, which is one of Society the hardest things. Society typically does not allow you to grieve for a miscarriage. The first thing I can remember hearing after both mine was, well, it's probably for the best. Well, most of the comments that people would address in that way are generally true, but that's not what you want to hear. That does not help you resolve your grief, and it is honestly grief. And well, What they're trying to say is that... If the baby had been be carried determined, it might have been deformed. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, but it, it, we have decided that it is not right to abort a defective no. baby. Yes. So why, why should you we can't have it both ways, case? can you? Right. We uh. have gotten a letter recently from um, a Resolve chapter. I don't recall which one, but they had had a memorial service for miscarried children and stillborn children. It wasn't anything elaborate, and I probably would assume it was fairly ecumenical, but that... I mean, it gave you an outlet for that grief and that loss, and it allowed you to share with others that had experienced that. Acknowledge it, that you lost a baby. Kind of the letting go of that. And I really believe I have two earthbound children and two in heaven. Hmm. And that gives me comfort. And you're going to see them someday? I'm going to hmm. see them someday. Hmm. And I think it's important for women that have experienced that, like Lynn, to find that joy because there is joy hmm. in eternity and knowing that he that has begun a work in you will carry it out to completion i i believe miscarried babies will be in heaven also we had a reader send us would you call it an announcement Mm -hmm. and it was a memorial to their baby that they lost in miscarriage it had a poem in it and it had a a beautiful picture a drawing of a mother and a baby and it had the data that they lost the baby I thought it was great. She said that they sent it to family and friends to acknowledge that they had lost a baby. Well, this has been a very tender edition of Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk, and we hate to interrupt this broadcast right now, but Lynn, Leslie, and Janet still have a lot to share, so be sure to tune in again tomorrow for the remainder of their moving conversation with Dr. Dobson. These three brave ladies brought to light a lot of unknown hurts that accompany infertility. Be sure to pay attention to those in your life who are struggling with this pain and and put your arm around them. Visit today's broadcast page at drjamesdobson.org for more information about our guests and also their ministry. That's drjamesdobson.org, and then tap on the broadcast icon at the top of the page. Now, we also encourage you to get plugged in with us on social media the next time you're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, or YouTube. Be sure to search for Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. All of our profiles have uplifting content that you'll want to interact with and then share with your loved ones. You can read various articles or blogs that we've posted. You can listen to radio broadcasts or watch our latest informative videos. If you're tired of being discouraged by the negative content online, be sure to like and follow our pages for Family Talk. Simply search for Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk and get connected with encouraging and godly content. You will be glad you did. Finally, if you have an Amazon Alexa, you can now listen to Family Talk's daily broadcast there. This smart device allows you, through a hands-free command, to hear our latest programs. Go to drjamesdobson.org forward slash Alexa to learn how to activate your Amazon Alexa. And be sure to join us again tomorrow for the conclusion of Dr. Dobson's conversation with his panel of these three very special women. And next time you'll also hear from Dr. Roy Stringfellow, who offers a needed clinician's perspective. That's coming up right here on the next edition of Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. I'm Roger Marsh. Have a blessed day. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. Hi everyone, Dr. Tim Clinton here. When you think about your family, 
and where they'll be when you're no longer living? Are you worried? Are you confident? You hopeful? What kind of a legacy are you leaving for your children and their children right now? Here at Family Talk, we're committed to helping you understand the legacy that you're leaving your family. Join us today at drjamesdobson.org. You're gonna find helpful insights, tips, and advice from Dr. Dobson himself. And remember, your legacy matters. Hello everyone, Roger Marsh here for Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. The news comes in all shapes, sizes, and formats these days, but how do you cut through all the noise and get to the heart of the matters that affect your family? Well, come to Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk and sign up for Dr. Dobson's monthly newsletter. You'll find clarity on tough issues, encouragement for daily life, and trusted principles to help you build strong, healthy, and connected families. Go to drjamesdobson.org and sign up today. That's drjamesdobson.org.